Theory is History by Jiris Banaji. This is chapter 10, which is very long. Capitalist domination and the small peasantry, the Deccan districts in the late 19th century. 10.1, the subordination of labor to capital. There's a widespread notion that the Indian countryside is still to a large extent dominated by pre-capitalist relationships of a semi-feudal variety. What is this semi-feudalism supposed to consist of? According to one of the clearest exponents of this tendency, A. Baduri, its basic features are, one, an an extensive, non-legalized sharecropping system, two, perpetual indebtedness of the small tenants, three, rural exploiters operating both as landowners and lenders to the small tenants, Four, tenants having incomplete access to the market. Baduri describes a system of production in which the power of money is clearly of fundamental importance. The small producer, who may, for example, be a sharecropper, is indebted to his landlord, who extorts surplus labor from him on the basis of a relationship that is fundamentally one of economic dependence. The consumption loans through which the small producer is bound to his landlord moneylender form advances for the reproduction of his labor power. The small producer bears no direct relationship to the market because his land- landlord moneylender intervenes in the process of production to realize the surplus labor extorted from him on the market. Why is this system semi feudal? Because obviously, Baduri starts with a conception of capitalist relations of production in which none of those features would be compatible with these relations. For example, sharecropping would not be compatible with capitalist production, no more than money lending, bondage, etc. The same basic assumption underlies Utsa Patnaik's more recent arguments. She refers to feudal type exploitation such as leasing out, usury, etc. Here again, the prevalent notion is that the specific institutional forms of production relations, e.g. sharecropping, are in some sense integral to the definition of such relations. Putnik, however, bases her positions on a more specific idea common to many Marxists. Certain persons with no direct control over land, such as traders and moneylenders, can nevertheless acquire a claim on a, on a part of the peasant's surplus labor, and appropriate it in the form of trading profit and interest, respectively. The reason that the trader and money lender do not figure in our chart is because they represent essentially capital in the circulation process and not in the production process. The two major categories here are trading profit or interest and capital in the circulation process. Obviously, Petnik wants to argue that the surplus labor extorted by these traders and moneylenders does not take the form of surplus value, but represents rather mercantile profit or interest, depending on the case. But what is mercantile profit? A. In the sense of commercial profit, it would represent a redistribution from the, ba- from the mass of, su- of social surplus value. That is, it would presuppose the prevalence of the bourgeois mode of production in its developed form, under which merchants' capital and commercial capital represent only functionally specialized forms of that portion of the total social capital, which is in circulation. Each individual industrial capital assumes within its total life cycle the form of capital circulation in the specific shapes of commodity capital and money capital. Commercial capital is then only a transmuted form of commodity capital i.e. ultimately a function of the circulation process of industrial capital. From the point of view of industrial capital, mercantile or commercial profits represent costs of circulation. Insofar as mercantilist illusions ascribed the value-creating property of industrial capital to merchants' capital, it was necessary for Marx to stress their distinction of form or economic specificity. If trading profit were meant by Patnaik in this specific sense, i.e. what Marx calls commercial profit, then she she would have to assume the prevalence of the capitalist mode of production already in those periods of India's development, when traders and moneylenders played a decisive role in town and countryside. 
but this is not an assumption that Patnaik would want to make, obviously. B, in the sense of purely mercantile profit, i.e. representing stages of social economy in which merchants' capital functions as mediator in the exchange of commodities between separate enterprises. Regardless of their social character, trading profit would presuppose the prevalence of these other modes of production, and it would itself largely originate from out-bargaining and cheating, and from the ability to exploit long-term price differentials. In this case, capital in the circulation process would be merely a vulgar and misleading way of referring to merchants' capital in its pre-capitalist forms and functions. And here, the basic assumption would have to be that the peasants whose surplus labor these traders and moneylenders extorted were in fact autonomous, simple commodity producers. This essay attempts to show why a dilemma of this source, sort represents only a choice between the devil and the deep blue sea. It attempts to argue that the positions of Baduri and Patnaik and many others of a similar tendency rest on an erroneous conception of intervention in the process of production, on a failure to explore and understand properly Marx's views of the relationships in question, and finally, on a failure to analyze concretely the system of production that actually prevailed in various parts of the country as early as the 19th century. The nucleus of this essay consists, therefore, of precisely one such analysis of the disintegrating small production economy of the Deccan in the period shortly before and after the cotton boom, the 1860s. Let me begin, however, with Marx's fundamentally important remarks on the two forms of, sub -sub of subsumption of labor into capital, because these will figure centrally in the analysis later. These remarks are contained in a hitherto unpublished appendix intended to form part of volume one of Capital. Here, Marx distinguishes two basic stages in the historic process of the subordination of the small producer to capital, that is, in the long-term evolution of the bourgeois mode of production. The first of these he calls the formal subsumption of labor into capital, the second the real subsumption of labor into capital. Both forms imply capitalist relations of exploitation, i.e. the category of surplus value. That is, both forms imply the extortion of surplus labor as surplus value. However, the formal subordination of labor to capital presupposes a process of labor that is technologically continuous with earlier modes of labor. It is the form that crystallizes when capital confronts the small producer, invades his process of production, and takes it over without subjecting it to technical transformation. These relations of the formal subsumption of labor into capital may thus develop outside the framework of a specifically capitalist mode of production. They do not presuppose the bourgeois mode of production in its advanced or developed form under which labor is subordinated to capital no longer merely formally, but really. This real subsumption process entails a suspension of all inherited or existing labor processes, alien to the pure motion of capital itself. It presupposes the production of capital in the form of relative surplus value, hence a process of labor that is specifically capitalist. The formal subsumption of labor into capital implies that while the labor, uh, while the labor process remains continuous with earlier modes of labor, the process of production has become the process of capital, i.e. the self-expansion of value of the conversion of money into capital. This in turn implies that capital is here the immediate owner of the process of production and that the immediate producer is merely a factor in the production process and dependent on the capitalist directing it. The formal subsumption of labor into capital was, for Marx, the general form of every capitalist process of production insofar as it implied, one, the extortion of surplus labor in the form of surplus value, and two, the intervention of capital as the immediate owner of the production process. This general form, however, is not the developed or adequate form of the process of capitalist production, because the labor process remains external to the movement of capital, and therefore the individual capitals are not bound together by any objective social interconnection. The labor process remains technically fragmented or decentralized, whereas the pure movement of capital posits a centralization of the social means of production and labor power. In its developed form, the capitalist mode of production presupposes not simply the compulsion to perform surplus labor, uh, 
hence not merely the category of surplus value, but the constitution of the forces of labor as social forces, or the shedding by capital of its individual character. In a system based on the formal subordination of labor, capital retains its small-scale individual character, or it is embodied mainly by small capitalists who differ only slightly from the workers in their education and their activities. It is obvious that Marx, Marx's distinction of the two forms of surplus value, relative and absolute, corresponds exactly to the distinction between the real and the formal subordination of labor to capital. In the latter, based on absolute surplus value, increases in the rate of exploitation of labor power can only be a function of those mechanisms that produce absolute surplus value. Mainly, of course, a lengthening of the working day or a greater intensification of labor. Before proceeding further, it is important to investigate this form more closely. The first characteristic of such a system, i.e. the extortion of surplus labor as surplus value, is not sufficient to constitute this type of subordination. Thus, a moneyed capitalist, for example, a merchant money lender, may dominate the small producer on a capitalist basis. He may, in other words, extort surplus value from him without standing out as the immediate owner of the process of production. In this case, his domination will be based on control of only portions of the means of subsistence and production of the small producer. For example, he may advance to him his raw materials or tools without exerting any specific control over or pressure on the small enterprise. Clearly, such a system, a, pre a preformal subordination of labor to capital, would tend to lead in the vast majority of cases to the system of formal subordination, i.e. over time, the moneyed capitalist would gain control over the entire means of subsistence and production of this enterprise, so that reproduction of its process of production from one cycle to the next would now come to depend entirely on the advances he makes. This is the initial and rudimentary sense in which his intervention in the process of production would be established. <clears throat> a very important conclusion follows from all this. There might be historical situations where in the absence of a specifically capitalist mode of production on the national scale, capitalist relations of exploitation may nonetheless be widespread and dominant. Such relations would then take either of two forms. A. In a preformal sense, the small producer retaining control to one extent or another over his means of subsistence would nevertheless be subjected to exploitation by capital, insofar as the moneyed capitalist, e.g. the usurer, advances raw materials or tools or even both to the immediate producer and extorts surplus value in the form of interest. B. In the formal sense, that the small producer completely expropriated is nonetheless retained in his former process of production and subjected to exploitation by capital on a more continuous or intense basis. I.e., with capital disposing of the power to reconstitute the process of production from one cycle to the next, there are passages in which Marx assimilated cases of, of type A to type B, that is, did not regard the distinction as particularly important. 10.2 commodity expansion in the Deccan districts, 1850 to 1890. Even before the chronological divide separating the two halves of the 19th century, the weight of commodity economy in the life of the Deccan peasantry had made itself felt in a peculiarly retrograde form. Is a good year always good? The prolonged and severe depression that hit the small production economy of the Deccan districts on the decline of Peshwa power leaves no doubt on this score. It is true that in the central area of the Deccan, in a district like Ahmednagar, for example, one out of every two years in that 27-year period was a year of poor harvests or famines. But there were some unusually fine harvests in this period and they were all disastrous. The lack of any easy means of transporting grain meant that in these years when harvests were good, local markets were glutted and prices fell ruinously low. With rates of assessment worked out in relation to earlier price conjunctures, every long-term decline in the level of prices 
such as set in around 1822, or every abrupt and sharp fall in the level, such as occurred periodically in good years, would only intensify the degree of exploitation of the peasantry by the state. By the mid-1830s, at the height of this depression, the original rates of assessment had thus automatically doubled, according to a district collector who witnessed serious and widespread suffering in Ahmednagar. The alternation of good and bad years thus formed a series of bad years, a prolonged depression or a crisis that, de that the Deccan would emerge from only much later. This was a period in which large tracts of arable land lay waste or uncultivated, villages were deserted and the smaller towns fell into decay. It was in the early 1850s that this crisis began to pass. The declining or stagnant curves of cultivated area break and ascend swiftly around this point. With the introduction of the survey settlement, a systematic overhauling of the interim revenue system began in the Deccan. The new layers of the bureaucracy who argued out these revisions on paper, proponents of a system of peasant capitalism that had yet to emerge, established more precise criteria of classifications and the revenue scale, separating out the different components of differential rent in an effort to reallocate the burden of revenue demand. One of these officials, George Wingate, dated the turning of the tide to 1852-53. to 53. Ten years removed from that date on the eve of the cotton boom, he was writing, in all parts suitable for the production of exportable products, i.e. commodities, such as the southern Maratha country and Kandesh, these are promptly raised to meet the, the wants of the market, as shown by the rapid growth of the export trade of Bombay. The peasantry are becoming comparatively wealthy, independent, and enterprising, but Kandesh was the only dis district in the Deccan to become structurally integrated into the cotton economy that dominated the districts further east, outside the limits of the presidency in Barar. What about the districts further south, where the staple food grains, Jawar, Bajra, Nakni, dominated the cropping patterns? Wingate replies, It has been without due consideration, remarked of other parts of the country, and more especially of the the collectorates of Pune, Ahmednagar, Shalapur, and Satara, that the cultivators there continue the old round of grain crops and do not turn their attention to the raising of valuable products suited for export. The observation, however, is most unjust to them, for with the great populations of Bombay and Pune to feed within easy distance, it so happens that grain crops in the arid climates of those collectorates pay better than cotton or other exportable product products, and this is the reason why they are so extensively grown. In short, the peasantry was responsive to the market, Wingate argued, and if it continued a traditional crop distribution, then this was so mainly for economic reasons. In the districts south of Nasik, grain was a more profitable commodity. This special pleading on behalf of the responsiveness of the peasantry to the civilizing mission of imperialism contains some important clues. To start with, Wingate was writing before the cotton boom had started. That is to say, the expansion of commodity economy had already begun. It was in motion at least 10 years before the whole level of commodity prices was jerked sharply upwards by the boom in international cotton prices. In this conjuncture of commodity expansion, moreover, the staple food grains were supposedly increasingly produced as commodities. And finally, Wingate identified implicitly a basic structural contrast within the, within the, des within the Deccan districts when he isolated Kandesh. For while Kandesh, like Barar, produced largely for world markets, the districts further south, in the heart of the, of the Deccan, derive the impetus of their commodity expansion from the growing regional demand for food grains and other, produ other, produ other produce. That is, the division of labor was changing within the Deccan economy. The extent of arable land and cultivation did indeed pick up through this conjuncture, and the whole pace of commodity circulation quickened perceptibly. By the 70s and 80s, a district like Ahmednagar was exporting RS 3.5 million worth of basically agricultural produce. In 
By the 90s, further north, isolated Toluca's, like Chile's, Chile's gone, could export produce worth over RS5 million annually. When the bureaucracy later reflected on this whole period, it saw in it a commercial revolution that it qualitatively transformed the conditions of the old economy. A basic index of this transformation is the level of commodity production which prevailed on average through these decades. In the 80s, Ahmed Nagar exported, that is, sold outside the district, large quantities of wheat to Shalapur, Pune, and Bombay in order to import large quantities of the basic food grains along the opening afforded by the donned Manmed Railway. The trade in these staples was dominated by wealthy Batia and Marwari merchant, merchants based on the district itself. Immediately to the south, Pune imported the basic staples in even larger quantities. In 1873, the railway traffic registered a net import of 17,000 tons of grain. In 1878, of 34,300 tons in 1880 of 45,500 tons. Further south, Kolapar was a major exporter of paddy to the markets of the eastern Deccan and other parts of Bombay Karnatak. In the Konkan Ratnagari, devoting most of its crop pattern to the inferior cereals, depended crucially for its consumption of rice on the exports of Kolaba, Kolaba district. More local in expansion were commodities that generally required irrigation or relatively large outlays of capital. In the Satara villages, along the Krishna, sugarcane, and groundnut had begun to expand rapidly. The latter are exported in very great quantities to Bombay and thence to Marseille and Italy, where it is stated they are largely used in the manufacture of olive oil. Pune exported cabbages, potatoes, and other fresh vegetables in considerable quantities to Bombay. In Ahmednagar, the Tolukas around the town itself witnessed a considerable expansion of irrigated acreage due to the large demand for garden produce. Vineyards covered the best soil around the major local market, their crop destined for sale to merchants from Bombay. In Kandesh, the cultivation of linseed was spreading fast, owing to the Bombay demand, that is, to European demand, which absorbed 170,000 tons on average in the 1890s. That a more tightly integrated market was in the process of emerging over this conjuncture is suggested quite strongly by the behavior of commodity prices. For the country as a whole, and for a much longer period, which includes the late 19th century, Heard has established the effect of railway expansion in bringing about a progressive equalization of market prices. When one examines the early segments of local price curves, general, generally before 1860, the discrepancies between local prices, even within the same district, are perfectly apparent. The period from the cotton boom to the famine of 1876 then forms a sort of transition, during which the local series rapidly moved closer into line. During the famine itself, for obvious reasons, and in its aftermath, the series tend to merge into a thick line. Apart from, the, apart from this district, convergence impact, however, the commodity expansion of those years tended to reduce the annual amplitude of price fluctuations, that is, to modify the purely local determination of price movements that characterizes the least developed commodity markets. All of this would have meant the neighborhood or the neighboring prices were, in most cases, sufficiently strong to influence a given local price, as when the poor harvests reaped by the southern and central Tolucas of Kandesh in 1874-75, to 75, following several years of scarcity and floods, were combined in predictably disastrous fashion with low prices due to the bumper crops in Namar and Barar close by. These processes of price convergence and of the lower amplitude of fluctuations imply, moreover, not just a greater specific mobility of commodities due to improvements in the means of communication, which took place over that period, but the emergence and development side by side with the expansion of railways and metalled roads, of a whole number of, of depots and wholesale markets in various parts of the Deccan. Apart from the major commercial centers such as Pune or Jalgaon,
A large number of smaller towns and big villages come into prominence in this specific function. The population of such towns and villages, Karda, Vambori, Karad, Tiscaun, Sauda, Faisbur, Lasalgaon, etc., would tend to vary between 5,000 and 10,000 persons, and the mercantile sector to account generally for anywhere between 4 and 10% of those populations. It is these smaller centers that mediated the local inter-district and external trade of the Deccan, the moneyed capitals whose intervention in this trade was absolutely decisive, resided mainly in such centers, connecting links between the larger capitals of the major local wholesale market and the Toluca peasantry. The emergence of such centers specifically would tend to even out discrepancies between local price movements, enable the big peasantry to relate more easily to the open market, and facilitate the operation of a chain of mercantile transactions whose structure we shall come to shortly. But probably the most revealing single index of the specific weight of the commodity economy in the life of the peasantry is the fact that the whole system of state exploitation of the peasantry, the system of assessment and revenue demand, depended crucially on the estimated level of commodity prices at the time of introduction of a settlement, and on the access of groups of villages to local markets, wholesale centers, or, or railway stations. Both the survey and its revision based their classifications of such village groups in the revenue scale on the level of exports that any given group was considered capable of sustaining, apart from the more general circumstances determining differential rent. Thus, the commodity economy was the basic premise of the revenue system, just as the expansion of the market formed, in a broader sense, the nucleus of its program of civilizing the country, that is, introducing the bourgeois mode of production into it. The general process of commodity expansion described above would imply, moreover, that labor power is itself increasingly a commodity. It would imply the conversion of the small producer into a wage laborer, even if not necessarily into a productive worker, i.e. one employed by capital. This too formed an essential dimension of the economic liberalism of the colonial bureaucracy, a conception that vacillated between the moderately blithe optimism that India was fast reconstructing itself in the image of more advanced nations um, and the disenchanted, disenchanted rebuttals of this conception by those who sought to protect and strengthen the big peasantry against the moneyed capitalists. By and large, it was the sense of optimism that prevailed. Even the famines demonstrated the inexorable laws of liberal political economy, the inevitable destruction of the thrift small producer, and the rise of the English agricultural system of large landlords, capitalist farmers of large farms, and peasant laborers for wage, for wage. What made this optimism credible was the quite perceptible process of decay of the smaller peasant households. In Pune, many of them had, by the 1880s, following the devastating impact of two continuous famine years, given up hus husbandry and taken to be messengers constables, grooms, and day laborers. During a famine, the first option of most peasant households would be emigration. Those who stayed behind would generally have to subsist on relief works, and the fact that they stayed behind would indicate that most of these were households without livestock or deprived of, the lo of their livestock. A census, a census taken in Pune at the height of the famine of 1876 shows that of the total number of workers on relief, close to 50,000, exactly half were holders or underholders of land by occupation. A quarter of the district's emigrant population never returned, i.e. The, e. they abandoned agriculture or moved elsewhere to restart cultivation. The contrast with Kendesh is striking. The powerful currents of emigration that swelled up over those years took a large number of cultivating households precisely into areas like Kandesh and Barar. Here, during the famine, cultivating households formed only 22% of those compelled to subsist on relief. Mild indication of the more independent condition of the Kandesh peasantry, yet even here in a relatively favored zone of the Deccan with a still expanding land frontier, a process of proletarianization was underway well before the famine. There can be no doubt that the number of persons in Kandesh subsisting on their labor, on the sale of their labor power, has much increased of late years. This is owing to the fact of many cultivators 
having lost their lands either from the action of the civil courts or from inability to pay the government demand, while again the establishment of cotton presses and other factories has added largely to the demand for working hands. Kandesh wage rates would have formed a strong incentive to many small peasants to forsake their fields for the railway, the workshops, the cotton and spinning, meal, spinning mills, especially in a period of recurrent scarcities such as Kandesh went through over the whole of the 70s, and at a time when the average daily wage a small peasant would have earned from subsidiary occupations fluctuated around nine and a half annas. Drought, scarcity, and famine played a major role in the proletarianization of the small producer only because of the already exhausted and decrepit condition of the Deccan small production economy. This condition was ascribed in the first instance to the persisting pressure of revenue demands on, on peasant incomes. Even the more scientifically based classifications of the survey and its revision had in a greater number of talukas, only increased the general average rate of exploitation, straining to breaking point the resources of the poorer districts and talukas. In Shalapur, a district of, of this sort, a junior official wrote, I see no reason to doubt the fact that fact stated to me by many apparently trustworthy witnesses, in which my own personal observation confirms that in many cases the assessments are only paid by selling ornaments or cattle. A household without cattle was a household on the verge of extinction, either in the direct form of having to desert the Toluca and abandon cultivation, or in the less direct form of sinking into indebtedness. For land and bullocks are the principal organs of our body, in the same way as hands and feet are, the peasants said. It followed that against this background of intensified exploitation by the state, the famine of 1876 to 77 irretrievably ruined a large number of the smaller cultivators in Shalapur, against whose katas arrears would have been accumulating year after year, or who, to pay off the assessment, were forced to sell portions of their means of subsistence. In neighboring Satara, of a total of 46,000 laborers on relief, 53% derived from the peasantry. They would have represented, obviously, the most impoverished strata, the slightly better off small peasants choosing to migrate, with their pair of bullocks and a cow or two. In Nasik, a considerable number of persons were supposed to have sunk from the status of landholders to that of laborers. Thus, the proletarianization of the small producer was a process common to all districts of the Deccan, regardless of their specific rates of commodity production. It formed part of a longer, less visible cycle extending back into the early decades of the 19th century. Take the ruinous year of 1847-48 when Ahmed Nagar, Talukas like Rahuri, Navasa, and Sangamnar, Sang Sangamnar were compelled to disperse over half their grain output on the market. And Rahuri, at that time, to pay his rent, that is, the government demand a riot had frequently to part to part with a bullock or other property. Prices had fallen lower and lower under the pressures of a market overstocked with local grain. Wingate described the mechanism at work over that season. The assessment was always too heavy to be defrayed in full, but in a good season, such as 1847 to 48, the remissions given were of less amount and the demand on the riot consequently greater than in less favorable years. He was, in consequence, obliged to bring forward to market a larger amount of produce than in ordinary seasons to meet this additional demand for revenue, and by thus forcing sales, prices were lowered, <clears throat> and more and more produce had to be sold in order to raise the money he required to meet the extra demand, until the market became so glutted and prices so ruinously low that many households would either sink further into debt or alienate their means of production in distress sales. Thus, in Navassa, many of the riots had to resort to the money lenders and in many cases to dispose of the farming stock. This is how even a year of general abundance could, like a year of famine, accelerate both the proletarianization of the small producer and the rate of expansion of the moneyed capitalist. Beyond the countryside proper and the Deccan towns, a similar movement was in progress.
Here, rising subsistence cost and the competitive pressures of machine-based commodities were jointly driving many artisan families either deeper into debt or into the more obvious forms of wage labor. In Kalapur, many weavers had come to work as laborers. In Nasik, further north, they had to take a field or even to work as day laborers. Given the specific nature of the relation of the indebtedness, which we shall examine later, it is possible to understand why even the falling costs of raw materials supplied by machine production would scarcely have improved the fortunes of the majority of weavers, and only increased the profits of their capitalist exploiters. Again, many artisan households would have joined the currents of emigration during the famine years. In the town of Yola in Nasik, where weavers formed 57% of the total population, large numbers were compelled to migrate in the hope of employment elsewhere. These then were among the basic phenomena of the process of commodity expansion that occurred over the late 19th century. How far within this context did capitalist relations of exploitation crystallize or evolve? From the commodity, we move to capital. 10.3 Structure of capital in the Deccan only the, le only the less developed forms of capital, which within the framework of the capitalist mode of production in its developed sense would form subordinate types, pure functions of the circulation process of industrial capital had evolved in the colonial economy. Thus, in most Deccan districts, merchants and traders formed numerically the dominant sector of capital, ranging from 60 to 75% of all persons with positions implying the possession of capital. The other groups consisted of rentiers, money changers, shopkeepers, bankers, etc. In the more backward world of the Deccan, banking, mercantile, and usurer capital were, in most cases, inseparable. For example, in Kandesh, it was asserted that, as a general rule, the same man is often a merchant, a moneylender, and a broker. Why was this? Bureaucrats trained in the rudiments of 19th century political economy understood the underlying cause. At Jalgaon alone is there trade enough to allow of firms confining themselves to fixed branches of business. In other words, scales of production and circulation were just not sufficient to generate an elaborate division of labor, or take the example of one of the biggest capitalists in Nasik district. This man deployed a capital of between RS 300,000 and 400,000, which compares quite favorably with the larger capitals in Gujarat at that time. But who was he? A well-known Brahmin banker and moneylender from Can Kandar to Luka. Banker or moneylender? The fact is that it is impossible to answer questions like that. The bureaucracy directly encountered the difficulty. It wrote, The trading group is the most difficult of classification on account of the vague terms used meaning often simply merchant or trader. The more obvious case of this lack of differentiation or specialization was the almost total fusion of the twin categories of mercantile and usurer capital. There was scarcely a merchant who could not also be classified as a moneylender and vice versa. But it would be wrong to conclude conversely that such merchants come moneylenders were pure agents of the circu circulation process in the sense in which merchants and commercial capital are within the, the developed bourgeois mode of production. Precisely because the occupational classifications of capital did not reflect a strict division of labor of the sort that prevails where industrial capital predominates, the, the concomitant distinction between purely parasitic and basically productive types of capital becomes somewhat misleading. The system of production that prevailed within the Deccan will explain why. In Kalapur, the total estimated volume of capital available for loans amounted to the substantial sum of RS 3.1 million already by the early 1850s. Further north, Satara, 20 years later, was the site of a total capital of this sort, equal to RS 15.3 million. Fairly good data are available for Tazgaon Toluca in the south of the district. Here, the total Toluca capital was estimated at RS 900,000. Exclusive, exclusive of the capital of the great banking house of Jog, which may be set down at several lakhs additional. 
This size of capital was roughly equal to the total value of the Toluca's exports over four years. Over half of this sum was concentrated in, in Tesgaon it, town itself, and most of the rest in only about nine villages. The official who assembled all this data from what he thought were reliable sources estimated the number of big capitalists in the Toluca at 20 to 30, from a total of over 300 Saukars. This implies a fairly high degree of concentration, so that most of these 300 Saukars would have deployed capital sums of RS-1000 and RS-2000. <clears throat> the same data show that 38% of all Satara district Saukars has started business within the last 20 years, that is, since 1855. In fact, throughout the Deccan, and even more so in the districts further north, where Marwari capital tended to predominate, the emergence and expansion of these smaller money lenders was a relatively recent phenomenon. Between the commodity expansion of those years, 1852 on, and the general expansion and multiplication of the, of the class of money capitalists, there was a close, intimate, inseparable link, which we must turn to now. For there is one fact that the bureaucracy never tired of mentioning, and around which it structured some of its best social investigations. This was that the large majority of households in the Deccan countryside were, to one degree or another, indebted. The aggregate estimates, which indicate only an order of magnitude, magnitude would be 66 to 90 percent of such households across the Deccan as a whole. To grasp the deeper significance of these twin phenomena, the expanding moneyed capitals on one side and indebtedness on the other, we can start with the chain-like structure of operation of mercantile capital. Viewed, ver viewed vertically, the structure of this capital could be envisaged in the following way. The capitalist classes are first and most numerous, the small traders and money lenders of the villages, chiefly Marwaris and Guzers. These advance grain for seed and subsistence. The second class are the rich bankers or traders of large towns, including a good many Brahmins. Those Kulkarnists who are moneylenders are generally closely affiliated to these Brahmin bankers. They deal much less in advance of grain than the traders of lower caste or caste and have a much greater taste for getting land into their own hands and names. As the Kulkarnists are connected with these, the second class, so are the small moneylenders of the village villages mentioned in the first class, mere jackals to their richer caste fellows in the towns. The third class consists of cultivators who have kept out of debt. This account allows one to regroup the three classes of capitalists into two basic types. One, merchant moneylender banking businesses, organized on a caste basis, divided internally into a larger town-based capital more widespread in its range of operations, and a small sponsored capital operating locally, resident in the village itself, generally controlling a portion of its retail trade, started with capital borrowed from kinsmen and directly in contact with the peasantry. Two moneylenders sprung from the mass of the peasantry itself, by and large big peasants, a lot of them of the Kunbi caste, in India, with businesses of this or a higher sort organized on a caste basis, the smaller local capitals, capitals would, in many cases, have functioned only as elements of a collective grouping, with its main base in the towns and wholesale centers. Thus, it would make no sense to see the town merchants or bankers and the village moneylenders as entirely distinct agents personifying separate social functions. The point can be put differently. When the commission met to investigate the Deccan riots, it found that the smaller class of Sokars, who are also the most unscrupulous, have increased very considerably during the last 10 years, that is, since 1865. But this very rapid expansion of the small Sokars would, would to a large extent have signified only the general expansion and deeper entrenchment of many of the larger town-based capitals already constituted before the boom. The crucial mechanism here would have been the sponsoring of new capitals on a family or caste basis by way of an extension of the general individual scale of business of the firm in question. This would hold especially for the smaller Marwari and 
Guj- Gujarati moneylenders who usually begin business as clerks or servants of one of the established Saukars. Even in the districts further south, for example, Satara, where this leer was less well developed, the class of small lenders were thought to have little or no capital and to borrow from wealthy firms, i.e. from those traders whose dealings are on a large scale and who are almost always also large money lenders. The major exception to this pattern were the big peasants who turned to money lending. The bigger significance of this sort of stratification of capital is brought out by the fact that during the riots of 1875 in villages where Saukars of the Brahmin and other local castes shared the money lending business with Marwaris, it was usual to find that the latter only were molested. The faster rates of expansion of the sponsored capitals would imply on the one hand a gradual erosion of the sphere of activity of the indigenous moneyed capitalists and on the other, an increasing expropriation of the small peasantry. The riots would then have been a sort of united front of these classes against capitalists who had settled in the district or Toluca in the recent past. All this views the structure of such capital vertically, across the district, so to speak. The interconnections would take the form of a chain of operations extending from the peasantry on one side to the Bombay and international markets on the other. Take a Mednagar cotton, the cotton dealers who are Marwar and Gujarat Venice advance money to the landholders and buy their crops often before they are ready for picking. They pack it in bundles or duktas of about 120 pounds and send it to their agents in Amendagar, of whom there are about 20. From these agents, the cotton dealers receive advances and draw bills or hundis to the extent of 70 or 80 percent of the value of the cotton. After the cotton has come, the Amednagar agents sell it to Bombay merchants. The cotton bought by the agents of the Bombay firms is either offered for sale in Bombay or is pressed and shipped to Europe. The same sort of chain operated in field produce generally further south in Pune. Here, the merchants that deal direct with Bombay and other large markets are generally Marwar Venice. They export grain and other produce, principally garden crops. Field produce passes through several hands before it leaves the district. It goes to market generally through the village shopkeeper who passes it on to a dealer in some large town who sends it direct to Bombay or to some export merchant in Pune. The village shopkeeper generally gathers articles of export in exchange for money advanced or lent. He was usually a Gujarat or a Marwar Vani connected with the large towns with which he had business relations and where probably the money lender or whom on whom he is often dependent lives in kandesh the same structure of business covered most commodities apart from cotton as a rule the husbandman has received husbandman has received advances from or mortgaged his crop to some village money lender who in turn has borrowed from some larger capitalist in Kandesh Cotton, the big Bombay firms had to a large extent ex succeeded in modifying the standard pattern. Many of the native merchants resident in the towns of Saura, Faizpur, and Ravir purchased cotton in the Husingabad districts under con consignment for houses in Bombay. Further west, in Amulnair, the native merchants of the district simply purchased the articles for exportation from the riots and resell them almost immediately to some agents of Bombay native merchants, several of whom reside in Amulnair, and whose sole business appears to be the purchase and exportation to Bombay of cotton, linseed, tilly, and coriander seed. In the period we are concerned with, European firms had not made much headway, and the cotton trade of Kandesh was still almost entirely in native hands. According to the common practice, from September to the end of April, Growers and petty dealers go to the exporters and con contract to deliver a certain quantity of cotton within a given period. The dominance of Indian capital was destined to decline, however, for in the early part of this century, in Dulia and Jalgaon, the chief Kandesh markets, foreign firms, accounted for 50 to 75 percent of all upcountry sales. The variation afforded by Kandesh cotton was probably an expression of the more independent character of the peasantry there.
Jalap, which formed the main system on which cotton contracts operated, was already in a state of near disintegration by the late 90s, when in Talukas, such as Chalizgown, only the poor riots consented to such arrangements. Outside the Deccan, but still in the Bombay Presidency, in the much more prosperous Gujarat district of Broach, this independence was apparent as early as the 60s. There, ever since Broach became a field for the investment of European capital, the course of its cotton trade had changed considerably. Cotton is now bought in one of two ways, either by the local agents of Bombay firms or by the owners of ginning factories in Broach. The local agents, when ordered to buy, sometimes send out their own broker to the villages to purchase direct from the grower, but they generally do business through the dealer, who, as in former times, gets the cotton into his hands by making advances to the cultivators. The nature of the dealings between the cultivator and the wakaria would seem to have somewhat changed since 1850. The advance is now said to be earnest money to bind the cultivator to his bargain, rather than the mortgage to his crop by the cultivator to tide over the hard months on to harvest. Thus, the penetration of European commercial capital into the cotton trade of districts such as Broach and Kandesh did not imply a tighter domination of the peasantry. The evidence seems to suggest that the reverse, the growing independence of the peasantry vis-a-vis -vis local moneyed capitalists and the deeper entrenchment of European firms, were phenomena that coincided in time though their internal connection cannot be traced out here. The more typical form that the chain assumed further south in the heart of the Deccan reflected the far more dependent character of the peasantry in those districts. The greater intensity of domination of the peasantry by the local, by local moneyed capitalists. This was the zone in which peasant resentment against the intrusions by moneyed capitalists was chiefly concentrated. The general area within which most of the known assassinations of moneylenders actually occurred. There's a simple statistical index of this pattern. In 1891, according to the census figures, over 55% of the total Marwari population of the presidency resided in the three districts of Nasik, Amendagar, and Pune, districts whose share of the total presidency population was roughly 10%. As an illustration of the specific weight of the more expansive Marwari capital resident in the core district of the Deccan, one might take Parnar Taluka in Amendagar. Here, the biggest money lenders were, almost without exception, Marwaris. In the village of Parnar itself, of a total of 50 local money lenders, only six, all of the Marwaris, accounted for over one third of the total acreage that had passed into the Katas of the money lenders or of money lenders generally in the previous 40 years. The biggest of them, Tularam Karamchand, controlled at least on paper 659 acres transferred into his kata through 55 separate tra transactions. Tularam's father, Karamchand, had settled in the Toluca even before 1820. In the 30s, Tularam, his eldest son, had joined him as his agent. By 1875, Tularam to, to Laram's accumulation of 660 acres represented an annual income of RS 3,600. 3, 3, I don't know what RS means. Rubles? I know I've been seeing that over and over again, but... Chandraban Bapuji, the second biggest money lender in Parner, controlled 520 acres transferred through 31 separate transactions. His father likewise had come to Parner around the time that the British took over the Deccan districts, and like Tularim, Chandraban had started off in a small way. The Parner data also illustrate the expansion side by side with the larger capitals of the smaller, predominantly indigenous capitals. Around half the number of money lenders had built up catas of general less, generally less than 20 acres. The chronological distribution of the individual transactions through which partner money lenders built up their estates of varying sizes shows a quite definite and interesting pattern. Of a total of 271 such transactions, one third belonged to the early 60s and slightly over one third to the early 70s. When the boom had broken and prices were declining rapidly. The mass of small money lenders, many of them sprung from the peasantry itself, 
would have expanded their catas basically in the second phase or within five years of the date of the commission inquiry. Those in Kolgam village of Shrigonda, 12 Kunbi Saukars examined state that they have all commenced business within the last five years. It is this very recently emerged layer that would have experienced the crises of 1875 to 77 as a severe limit to its further rapid expansion, even if in the aftermath of the riots, the bigger money lenders such as Tularem and Chandraban were hauled up before the criminal courts on charges of forgery and extortion. Finally, an examination of the data collected by the commission from various villages of Pune suggests that over the longer period from 1854 to 55 to 1874 to 75, the moneyed capitalists tended to withdraw from the smaller villages and relocate their activities in the faster expanding larger villages. Thus, in the big villages of Indip in Indipur or Telagon, each with a total of 370 to 80 katadars, both the numbers of saukars in operation and the total assets controlled by them tended to expand fairly rapidly. In Telagon, for example, there were only three saukars in 1854 to 55, and they controlled in their own names only 122 acres. Ten years later, in the middle of the boom, their number had expanded slowly to 11, and their total acreage to 556. Another 10 years later, over the crest and decline of the boom, their number had shot up to 46, and the total acreage controlled by them, 3,110. On the other hand, in the very small villages, both their numbers and their control tended to decline. There was Nimgaon Kedki, for example, where by 1874 to 75, only one Saukar was left, controlling half the amount that he and others had controlled earlier. How does one explain this movement? By modifying the structure of differential rent, the commercial expansion of those 20 years would have ex exerted strong pressures on the relocation of such capital. Small Saukars who started off in the 1850s in the smaller villages of Atoluca would over time shift to the bigger villages, closer to the nerve centers of commodity expansion. Among the Saukars jailed after the riots was one Haririm Boban, who had shifted from Panadi in Perner to Perner itself, requiring, as he says, a large sphere. Ten point four interest a surplus value, increasing formal subsumption of labor into capital. Abstracting from differences internal to the structure of this class, it is not difficult to see that the sector of capital and of society as a whole would have been the greatest beneficiary of British rule. The penetration of the moneyed capitalist into the small production economy of the Deccan coincided with and sheltered behind the takeover of these districts by the Brit British bureaucracy. Despite the systematic attacks to which they were continually subjected in writing, these capitalists were never seriously threatened by the state and even the effort to modify the impact of their domination with the passing of the Agriculturalists Relief Act only subdued the pace of their expansion. Shifting their preferences from mortgages to direct sales. The reason for this contradictory behavior lies, of course, in the structural role that this class played within the framework of colonial domination. State exploitation of the peasantry was premised on the expansion of commodity production. But however responsive the Deccan peasantry may have appeared to men like the Wingate, the peasantry as a whole was in no position to sustain this effort. Commodity expansion thus came to be mediated through the interventions of the moneyed capitalists. One concrete piece of evidence is enough to demonstrate the role in this process. In 1851, in 1850 to 51, the last year of the old revenue system in the in that Toluca, 11 villages of Tezgaon paid RS 40,373 into the treasury on account of revenue. Tezgaon were a typical case. Then this would mean that the whole or if Tisgown were a typical case, then this would mean that the whole system of state exploitation of the peasantry depended crucially on the moneyed capitalist, just as the control he came to exercise over the peasantry found one of its deepest sources in that very system of exploitation.
Why would peasant households have borrowed? When the commission asked the collector of Pune, he replied, the riots generally attribute their embarrassments to the weight of the assessment and also to the operation of the civil courts. In the poorer Talukas of Shalapur, further east, the basic cause of indebtedness was that the rates are so high. This underlying pressure would not necessarily be expressed directly in more immediate causes that led groups of households into the hands of moneylenders. At his gown, Saukar th thought the riots borrowed chiefly to buy cattle and to marry. This was the opinion of a man who has occasion to go into the civil courts upwards of 50 times a year. Among the various immediate causes of indebtedness listed by peasant households interviewed by the commission, four basic categories stand out. Subsistence costs or consumption loans, normally on a running grain account basis, form the prevalent type, 25% of all instances. The need to purchase bullocks was likewise important, 23%. Another 23% of cases derived from what one might call the social costs connected with kinship and marriage. Finally, the pressure of assessment was itself listed as an immediate cause in 14% of all cases. This establishes that in close to half the total number of cases in this sample, shortage of means of production and subsistence was listed as the immediate pressure compelling households to borrow. We shall see later when we come to the structure of the Deccan peasantry that this was a compulsion specific to the lower strata of the peasantry, and that the so social costs of kinship would normally involve strata of the middle peasantry and not otherwise compelled to meet subsistence costs from loans. On contracting a debt, the household would, in most cases, find itself incapable of reimbursing it, unless, as happened occasionally, a good harvest coincided with a year of high prices. Years of scarcity and famine, of which there were several, would drive these households only further into debt, so that finally they would often have to confront several creditors. Over time, a household in this position would find itself subsisting at the mercy of its creditor, who would in this way come to establish control over its reproduction process from one cycle to the next. Elements of the production process would, have, would be advanced to the peasant, either in money form or directly in material form and the peasant would then surrender the whole of his crop by way of interest payments. Where these payments included those portions of the means of production over which the small producer still retained control, e.g. bullocks, which was frequently the case, this would only intensify the dependence of his process of production on the advance of elements required for its reconstitution. Ow. This is the initial approximation, and it is the hallmark of vulgar empiricism that sticks fast to this surface appearance. When the gazetteers describing the chain of mercantile operations discussed earlier wrote, the local leaders would advance money to the grower and buy his crop before it was ready for picking. Emphasis mine. Then the surface appearance here is definitely that of a transaction between sellers and buyers. In other words, this super superficial appearance belongs strictly to the sphere of simple circulation, and within this sphere and its appearance, the household figures as a simple owner and producer of commodities. As far as the civil courts, i.e. bourgeois law, was concerned, only this appearance mattered, for in law all commodity owners are equal. The crucial point comes now, Marx describing the case where buyer and seller become creditor and debtor respectively, where the price of the commodity has been realized in advance before the commodity is handed over, cited the example of the advance payments prevailing in other parts of India in the, in the purchase of opium. We know today that the opium trade was hardly as simple as this, and that very few of the households producing poppy could validly be called simple commodity owners. Marx himself, Marx himself was aware that in the transaction M C, M might represent not simply money in its functional form of means of purchase, but capital being advanced, as it almost always is, in the form of money. Of course, capital too is advanced in the form of money, and it is possible that the money advanced in the transactions in opium is capital advanced. To simplify matters and somewhat schematically, the advances could be seen in one of the two quite distinct ways. A. According to the laws of simple circulation, 
The advances would represent payments for the commodity or a realization of the price of the commodity before the commodity itself is handed over. In this case, <clears throat> sorry, in this case, money would function as a means of purchase. B, according to the laws of capital circulation, the advances would represent advances of capital in money form. That is to say, here in case B, the advances would reconstitute the process of production by enabling the reproduction of labor power, the peasant's subsistence, and reproduction of the means of production, his seed, bullocks. Whereas in A, the crop sold in advance would represent the peasant's commodity, in case B, it would rep it would rep it would, rep it would represent <laughs> the commodity capital of the capitalist who has made the advances. That is, the capital he advanced at the start of the cycle, now expanded to include surplus value, but emerging at the end of the labor process in commodity form. To which of these schematically distinct cases would the relations of the Deccan economy conform? We have already seen that the peasantry of the Deccan borrowed in most cases to meet its subsistence costs and other simple reproduction costs, i.e. to reconstitute their process of production from one year to the next. This is not a situation that fits well with case A, where the agents of the production process are independent, simple commodity owners and producers. That a system of capitalist exploitation was in fact embodied in the advances emerges more clearly when we turn back to the historical sources. In Pune, the husbandman, when his crops were reaped, threshed and garnered, carted them in lump to his creditor's house or shop. As he had parted with all his crop, the husbandman had to borrow fresh sums in case in cash or grain to meet the installment of land revenue or his own support and for seed. So here are the basic circulating elements of the process of production derived entirely from the advances from the advances in Kandesh, both town and village moneylenders often advance grain and money for seed and to support the cultivator's family during the rainy season. These advances are repaid at harvest time with the addition of 50% to the sum advanced. But why would such repayments have not disentangled the household from the grip of its creditors? The answer is interesting. The small producer's dependence on the moneyed capitalist would not necessarily continue because the account still remained open or because the household still had to pay off its debts. Thus, in Sauda Toluca, when the produce of the land has been gathered into the coolie and the grain ready for market, the saukar, the saukar closes his account for presentation to be liquidated either by money payment or in grain. By a mutual arrangement contracted at the commencement of the season, the accumulated debts of the year are for the most part dispersed in grain. In other words, even if the debts were repaid, the small producer would be left with absolutely no means of subsistence for the coming season. His dependence on the capitalist would thus continue from one cycle to the next, even where at the close of every cycle the payments covered the accumulated debts for the previous year. It is this domination of the small producer by the capitalist that accounts for the fact that the small cotton-growing peasantry of Toluca's, such as Dulia, gained absolutely nothing from the boom of the 1860s. The sudden and excessive rise in the price of cotton has given a, a great stimulus to the cultivation of this crop, but as yet the riots do not appear to have profited much by this change, the native merchants being the only parties who are really the gainers. If the cotton crop represented to a large extent the commodity capital of moneyed capitalists rather than the commodities of the small producer, then the rise of commodity prices would leave the small producer quite untouched. In Toluca's, where, rational, where relationships of this type prevailed, the moneyed capitalists controlled the bulk of the local produce. Again, in Sauda, the Saukars hold direct control over the greater portion of the produce raised. And it was in this sense that Davidson, who witnessed this system in the 60s, wrote quite correctly, the cultivation of the entire district is conducted by the moneyed capitalists. Translated into Marxist terms, this statement would read, the process of production of the entire district is controlled by moneyed capitalists. There were, of course, a few officials in the bureaucracy who did manage to separate the surface appearances from the inner content of such relations.
One of them, an assistant collector stationed in the eastern Tolucas of Puna, shortly before the famine, wrote, The Sakhar gives the riot sufficient to eat and take the remainder of the produce as part payment of the interest of the debt. This is what actually takes place, though of course on the surface the facts look somewhat different. The riot borrowing cash from the Sakhar and paying government while the Sakhar debits him the cash and credits him with the produce. Here, McPherson came very close to understanding the purely capitalist nature of the relationship between the peasant and moneylender. The surplus value extorted from the small producer would be called interest, but this would only express the specific form in which relations of production enter the consciousness of its agents. Commenting on Wakefield's description of the depressed condition of the Irish tenantry, Marx wrote, In this case, Ireland, profit is called rent, just as it just as it is called interest, when, for example, as in India, the worker, although nominally, nominally independent, works with advances which he receives from the capitalist and has to hand over all the surplus produce to the capitalist. Commodity relations of production are never directly reflected in consciousness. Their forms of appearance mediate their reception into consciousness. In fact, it would be quite wrong to suppose that these superficial appearance forms of the basic relations of production represented nothing but pure show, something illusory or unessential. They represented the necessary forms of appearance of capitalist relations in the conditions of a small production economy where the process of labor remained the process of the small producer. This is the specific situation that Marx described at some length in theories of surplus value. The third of the older forms of interest-bearing capital is based on the fact that capitalist production does not as yet exist. That is, its premise is the absence of the specifically capitalist mode of production in its developed form of relative surplus value production. This implies, first, that the producer still works independently with his own means of production, and that the means of production do not yet work with him. In other words, it implies that the process of labor remains that of the small production economy, Secondly, that the means of production belong only nominally to the producer. In other words, that because of some incidental circumstances, he is unable to reproduce them from the proceeds of the sale of his commodities. Thus, the second characteristic of this form, apart from its technological continuity with earlier modes of labor, is the latent crisis of simple reproduction, which the small production economy is thrown into either under the pressures of a series of bad years, incidental circumstances, or for more basic structural reasons, such as state exploitation of peasant production. This crisis of simple reproduction, the hopeless inability of small producers to renew their process of production from one cycle to the next, is precisely what expressed, on the one hand, in the proletarianization of the small producer in the Deccan, on the other hand, in the rapid incursions of the moneyed capitalist. If the small production economy of the 1850s already contained such latent defects, then the crises of the period that followed only intensified those defects through the massive and staggering devastation of livestock, and by forcing sales of land and other means of production, crippling reserves of labor power, and pushing up subsistence costs in general. Marx continues that in this form, the producer pays the capitalist his surplus labor in the form of interest. That is to say, the capitalist extorts surplus value in the form of interest. For as Marx writes elsewhere, the exorbitant interest which the capital of the usurer attracts is just another name for surplus value. It follows, and this is Marx's own conclusion, we have here in the form just outlined the whole of capitalist production without its advantages. The development of the social forms of labor and of the productivity of labor to which they give rise. Thus, the third of the older forms of interest-bearing capital would compose a system of capitalist exploitation, but outside the framework of this specifically capitalist mode of production based on machinery, continuous revolutionizing of the process of labor, and the production of relative surplus value. It would compose the form which we encountered earlier as the formal subsumption of labor into capital. This form is very prevalent among peasants, or among peasant nations who already have to buy a portion of the necessaries of life and means of production as commodities. India was one such peasant nation in Marx's day, as were Egypt, China, and Peru.
It is now possible to detect the fault underlying so many of the arguments that downgrade the development of capitalist relations in India. Arguments of the sort that Baderi or Patnaik propose confuse the capitalist's intervention in or control over the process of production with the specifically capitalist form of the labor process. When the process of production of a small peasant household depends from one cycle to the next on the advances of the usurer, when, without such advances, the process of production would come to a halt, then in this case the usurer, i.e. the moneyed capitalist, exerts a definite command over the process of production. This control or command is established and operates even when, as in this case, the labor process remains technologically primitive, manually operated and continuous with earlier archaic modes of labor. The purely formal and stereotyped conceptions of capitalist production that see in its basic relations only the glitter of technological advance, machinery, fertilizer, and so on, have very little in common with Marx's understanding of capitalism and derive in large part from the formalism promoted by Marxists like Dobb. Let me pose the question more sharply. Is the domination of capital over the small producer, that is the extortion of surplus value from small peasants, artisans, etc., compatible with the forms of the process of labor specific to those households? Both Marx and Lenin answered quite clearly, yes. For the fact is that capital subsumes the labor process as it finds it. That is to say, it takes over an existing labor process developed by different and more archaic modes of production. This is a theme that Lenin had to constantly emphasize against the Narodniks in Russia, even at the cost of coining terms like medieval forms of capitalism. It follows that in these forms, based on the formal subsumption of labor into capital, the small peasant is a simple commodity owner only by way of his, of his external attributes. In Ahmed Nagar, on one report, 75% of the cultivators may be said to be overwhelmed with debt. I have never spoken to one of the poorer classes who did not admit that he was completely in the hands of the Saukar. I have often seen the Saukar sitting in the field while the crop was being reaped, which shows that, in such cases at least, the cultivator is not a free agent but is compelled to part with his crop. Again, the sort of compulsion that Norman witnessed around 1874 was a compulsion specific to capitalist relations. The peasants whom Norman saw were not bonded laborers of any variety. Labor mortgaging was common in various parts of the Deccan from Satara to Kandesh, but the compulsion or element of unfreedom that this assistant collector saw pertains specifically to the fact that the small peasants of Ahmednagar were not free to dispose of their crop as they chose as long as they were bound by a capitalist who year after year paid their subsistence costs their wages, and to one extent or another controlled their means of production. That is to say, in these relationships there was no fixed political and social relationship of, suprem of supremacy and subordination of the sort that characterized the feudal economies of Europe. The person appropriating surplus labor and the person surrendering it were bound together by the pure money relationship. The process of exploitation was here stripped of every patriarchal, political, or even religious cloak. The coercive power of the moneylender was the coercive power of capital in its general form, the form in which it is common to, more, to the more advanced forms of capitalist production. 10.5, the big peasantry of the Deccan. The social formation that became involved in this complex and uneven process of the formal subordination of small producers to moneyed capitalists was one whose internal social morphology was changing rapidly in the 19th century. There's a fair amount of evidence which shows that indebtedness has, or is indebtedness as such was not a condition peculiar to the class of small producers. The traditional local ruling classes of the Deccan had likewise to one degree or another become bankrupt and financially dependent on the bigger banking houses and moneylenders. Economically, at least, the Saukar was often the wealthiest individual in a given village or small town. The most opulent house there would belong to his family, even if they had moved in only a generation back. The Sirdars of Kalapur formed a tiny and, in general, wealthy fraction of the district's population. But of the 600-odd Sirdars, 
all are in debt and half of the annual revenue is gathered into the, off into the coffers of the bankers. These sirdars continue to live in sufficient ease, many of them maintaining retinues of 50 to 80 servants. But their estates were heavily mortgaged to a stratum of bankers, who likewise lived in very comfortable circumstances in neighboring retinagari. Um, the, picture, um, the picture was even bleaker. Many of the original Kot families have now passed away and the Kot estates are now either held by Saukars or by impoverished Kots who are entirely in the hands of Saukars. So in the southern periphery of the presidency, the sector of big agrarian property had fallen into fairly deep financial dependence on the moneyed capitalists. Like the Telukdars of the United Provin Provinces, their fortunes were fast declining in the 19th century. Further north in the central Deccan area, many Patil families had fallen into similar circumstances. In Havili, Toluca of Pune, the Petter Vit Viduji affords a good instance of the old-fashioned debtor. He has recently mortgaged the whole of his large garden lands and well to Sudu Bapu for a debt of RS 900. What makes this case striking is that Sudu was a kunbi by caste. A more typical case comes from Parner village. The Kauri family held the patelship of Parner two generations back when the office was one of great dignity. There is not now one yoke of bullocks or acre of land in Parner village held by the Kauris. Raji Sukraji Kauri's father had owned some 60 acres, which is all gone into the hands of moneylenders, mainly those of a Marwari who started his business in that area only in the late 60s and over seven years had accumulated 108 acres. There was the Patel of Kurdi village in Sauda, whose father had owned 70 acres of the best land. By the 70s, a series of debts incurred mainly to finance the costs of marriage, coinciding with the price depression, left this man in the position of a day laborer. My eldest son is also a day laborer. Or there was the aged Patel of Yalavi in Tazgown, a rich and independent man who, under British rule, had descended from the position of a jugger... Jagadar Patil to, to what he is pleased to term a day laborer. In the sharpest possible contrast to this declining curve of encumbered traditional estates, a big peasantry was slowly entrenching itself in the, de in the Deccan. This was a layer of the peasantry that based its, its expansion on that very mobility of agrarian property signified by the decline of Sirdars, Patels, Kats, Jagadars, Inam Inamdars, and so on. These were the peasant households whom the bureaucracy called quite impressionistically well-to-do husbandmen, or occasionally small capitalists. A well-to-do husbandman was defined in the first instance precisely in relation to the system of capitalist exploitation that was crystallizing across the Deccan. That is to say, he too was engaged in lending money or in exploiting the labor of other peasants on a basis scarcely different from the one described earlier even if on a smaller scale. The following picture of such households emerges from the descriptions of the bureaucracy. They generally sold their produce directly on the market. They saved a considerable part of their incomes. They possessed sufficient, res uh, sufficient reserves to last out one or two very bad seasons. They owned a better quality of livestock and could afford to feed their cattle much better. They would generally cultivate bagate land to which they applied large quantities of manure. And finally, apart from hiring day laborers, they could afford to maintain a reserve of permanent farm labor, probably to meet peak season demands in areas of labor shortage, such as Kandesh. In Ahmed Nagar, households of this sort could be found in the immediate periphery of the town or in Toluca's, like Navassa, where the soil was generally good. In this Toluca, a few husbandmen, husbandmen hold farms of over 200 acres and have 20 to 30 bullocks, and a good many are free from debt and have grain pits of their own. What would have been the significance of this stratum in a district so tightly dominated by professional moneylenders? 
about 60% of all money lenders in the district are traders, and 40% are husbandmen and others. In other words, even here, a fairly large proportion of money lenders were of peasant stock in occupation. They would have formed part of the smaller local layer of moneyed capitalists that entered its process of expansion only in the depression following the boom. In Pune, such households of rich landholders, or small capitalists as they were called here, themselves bring their produce to the large markets of Pune and Jenner. This better class of cultivators generally had stocks of their own to weather the bad seasons, and of course to lend out as grain for the subsistence of the smaller peasantry. Here, 30% of money lenders were husbandmen. Further south in Satara, such households exported their produce directly to Pune and Chiplin. In the south and southwest, portions of the district, large and well-to-do husbandmen regularly utilized permanent farm laborers on the labor mortgage system. In Shalapur, district to its east, substantial farmers could be found in every village of any size as early as the 50s. They were in most cases patils and the higher classes of farmers who always carried on their field operations by means of hired labor. In Kalapur, the big peasantry could afford the cost of growing sugarcane, probably the most expensive crop next to grapes, and would generally crush the cane in their own genas. This was, of course, before the main period of expansion of cane cultivation in districts like Kalapur. The saving classes of the district included, among others, a few rich cultivators. It was, however, in the more intensely commercialized north in Nazik and Kandesh that this layer of the peasantry was more obvious or prominent. In Nazik, where they combined money lending with husbandry, such households would deploy minimum capitals of RS 2000. Here, village headmen and rich cultivators frequently, but on a small scale, lend money and advance seed grain. In Dulia Taluka of Kandesh, we find a great number of very substantial farmers all over the district. Only these big peasants could afford to give their cattle anything like proper sustenance, or only they were able to manure their fields properly. The control of the better quality of livestock and more of it meant, moreover, that almost all well-to-do husbandmen sell clarified butter, or ghee. Ghee. G, <laughs> mainly for local consumption. In all the districts of western Kandesh, close to the Gujarat border, the assistant collectors generally encountered substantial men with plenty of cattle and large holdings. In one or two instances, wrote one of them, I have noticed that the lands belonging to Bils in the Sahada villages are now falling into the possession of Kunbi farmers. These would have been the poorer Bil cultivators who were said to have been much impoverished during the seasons of 1872 to 74 and reduced to even more desperate circumstances in the famine that followed. Annual wage contracts were common in this part of Kandesh, where labor was scarce. Further east in Sauda, the peculiarity of the money lending system in this part of Kandesh is that the capitalists who lend are of the cultivating class themselves. They are not of the Marwari and Guzer classes. Thus, the Saukars, who in the Toluca controlled almost its entire process of production on Davidson's description, derived to a large extent from the peasantry itself. This becomes especially significant when one considers that Sauda witnessed much faster rates of expropriation of the peasantry than most Tolukas of the Deccan would have done. Excluding the few villages along the Satpuda range in most other areas of the Toluca, between 7 and 9 percent of the total village arable was transferred either on mortgage or through sales over three years in the early 80s. It was at this time, moreover, that the expropriation of the bill peasantry further west was just beginning. The beneficiaries of this transfer process would therefore be the big, the big, peasant, be the big peasants themselves. One striking expression of the behavior of this group in the famine is provided by the large sums of private capital invested in the construction of wells, both during the famine and in its aftermath. In Nasik, it was astonishing to see how many fresh wells were sunk. Baines assembled figures to show that in one year of the famine, the total number of ordinary wells expanded over 17% in the two talugas of Sinar and Nasik. 
Looking at the comparatively small amount advanced for wells by government to the riots in 1876 to 77, it is clear that the amount of private capital sunk is considerable. Whenever I have been encamped at the, at the river valley at Sinar, deepening and sinking wells has been going on all around. In Satara, it was obvious that many among the cultivators must be in easy circumstances and able to save. For more than half of the whole amount expended on well construction was obtained by riots from their own resources. It is clear that a considerable class of persons exist who are bent on effecting improvements on their land. In Pune, the low rate of wages at which laborers were up obtainable during the prevalence of the drought in Surur Taluka caused an extraordinary impetus to private expenditure on garden wells. Here, over 1876 to 77, 193 wells were repaired, and another 140 wells newly constructed entirely from private funds. If we take the average cost of digging a well in this period as RS400, then in that year alone, RS 56,000 of private capital was sunk in the construction of wells in just this one Toluca, where in an average year before the 70s, a Toluca of this size would not have expended more than RS 6,000. If we now take the big peasants and the big moneylenders together as a block, what picture of their investment behavior emerges over this period? In Ahmednagar and Pune, traders spend much of their savings in adding to their business and in house property. Cultivating classes, especially village headmen, spend their savings in buying cattle, sinking wells, and adding to their holdings or building houses. The house property that the Nagar moneylenders invested in would comprise, for example, the small budwalled and flat-roofed houses in which the poorer urban classes toward the north of the town lived at rents that could absorb 10% of their annual wages. In Satara, traders used their increased capital to extend their business. In some cases in which the possession of land has been transferred, especially, especially to husbandmen, the new holders have invested money in the land and taken steps to improve it. Now the general expansion of commodity economy, the connected expansion of railways, and the general rise of commodity prices would have boosted the demand for land over this period. The Satara Gazetteer tells us that land is perhaps the favorite investment with all classes possessed of a substantial surplus. Even among traders, all who are natives of the district are glad to own land. The fondness for land investment has undoubtedly increased under British rule. The first cause listed was the increased price of field produce. So commodity expansion would have entailed not just faster rates of expansion of moneyed capitals, but a faster rate of expropriation of the smaller producer. The demand for land would find its specific reflection not in the ordinary transactions of buying and selling, but precisely in the pressure exerted by moneyed capitalists for mortgages against the small producer's land. The railways alone would have completely shattered the existing structure of differential rent so that land would be most in demand in areas with easy access to the market. A detailed and careful analysis of some 2,000 transactions involving land sales in Sauda to Luka over the early 80s shows that the great majority of villages with the highest rates of land transfer, alternatively the highest rates of expropriation, fall east of a line drawn vertically down the Toluca and bisecting it roughly at face per in the center. Such villages lay, in other words, very close to the railway stations and within easy access of the, re of the river and Sauda markets towards Yaval. Moving away from the railway lines, the rates of land transfer show a distinct drop. The majority of villages in which the process of expropriation was most intense were distinctly suburb suburban in character. Um, lying within a five mile, five mile, five mile radius, five mile radius of the local towns. In such villages, the general average rates would exceed 3.33% per year. At this rate, the whole village arable would be transferred in one generation. At the other end of Maharashtra in Tuscaun, the highest rates of transfer were concentrated in the centrally located groups of villages around the Krishna River and near Tesgaon market. Investment in land thus took a specific and more complicated form conditioned by the prevalence of the small production economy. Moreover, it was not just a general mania for the ownership of land from the point of view of factors like prestige, but determined specifically by economic motives connected with the process of commodity expansion.
It follows also that investment in money lending was not simply a process of extortion, a surplus labor, a surplus value, but also a process of expropriation of the small producer, and thus part of the concentration of the means of production as capital. Relating this back to the more general remarks on how traders spend much of their savings, it is possible to see that much of the investment behavior of big money lenders and big peasants relates to an accumulation and concentration of capital, but within the specific limits imposed by labor processes continuous with those of the small production economy. 10.6 Peasant Differentiation The descriptions provided by various revenue officials suggest that we can posit the following classes of the Deccan peasantry. One, a big peasantry, exploiting small peasants as money capitalists and employing hired labor in cultivation. Two, a small peasantry differentiated internally into <clears throat> one, an independent middle peasantry that incurred loans to meet occasion, occasional expenses of an economic or social nature. I'm sorry, that would have been A. B, a more depressed and dependent middle peasantry regularly exploited by moneyed capitalists from whom it derived much of its means of subsistence and production. And then three, a semi-wage labor peasantry structurally dependent on hiring out its labor power and not generally credit worthy. <coughs> Davidson in his account of the Sauda and Yaval Talugas writes, I would divide the cultivators into three classes. One, individuals holding land, either Deshmukhs, Patels, Chudris, or Kulkarnis, who being possessed of considerable wealth, lend it out at interest to the poorer cultivators, besides which they purchase largely the produce both for consumption within the district and for export. Two, individuals who are in comfortable circumstances and can farm their lands without applying to the Saukars for capital. Three, the larger portion of the cultivators are included in this grade who are absolutely in the hands of the wealthier class, to whom they apply for money in the first instance to enable them to purchase their seed grain, also sufficient to support existence while their crops are in the ground. Thus, here in a sector of the Deccan defined by very high rates of commodity production, the combination would be one plus two. It's a mathematical equation. I don't, I don't, one plus two I in brackets plus two I I in brackets. I'm sure that makes sense to some people. Further east in the Talukas where a bill peasantry was more common, the general combination would include them as three, a class dependent on wage employment. <clears throat> South of Kindesh in Nasik, Nasik, Ramsey classified the peasantry on a similar model. My own opinion, briefly put, is that about one-third of the cultivators are hopelessly in debt, that is, would depend on advances for their annual subsistence. Another third more or less so, and the remaining third free from serious encumbrances. I allude here to the better portion of the district, namely the Deshi villages as opposed to the peasantry in the hills. Here, a similar combination prevailed with the important difference that 2i, the independent middle peasantry, was in a state of far deeper dependence on the moneyed classes. This is confirmed by Baines, who made a statement that is otherwise difficult to comprehend. The greater portion of the middle class cultivators of the Deshi villages exist by the favor of their creditors in a state of fairly well-to-do solvency. That is, they mostly owe a good deal more than they ever are able to pay. This is the sort of layer within the general stratum of small peasants that would experience a quite perceptible decline in its position in the event that the rates of assessment were enhanced or in periods of scarcity and famine. Households of this sort would be compelled to intensify their labor activity and or cut down their level of consumption under pressures of this type. The decision to intensify labor activity might mean deeper dependence on the Saukar by way of an application for the money with which to construct wells. Thus in Nasik, the recent scarcity has of course increased the burden thus thrown upon them, but they will place it over to their sons. The commission investigating the riots found that for a large number of households, indebtedness was an inherited or ancestral condition, reflecting debts incurred by the previous generation. In 1875, these households would have formed a, a depressed middle peasantry, 
but its origins would lie in the disintegration of a more independent layer than had been forced into the hands of moneyed capitalists over the previous 30 years. And Chalopper, the collector, thought not much pressure for the collector thought not much pressure for recovery of arrears should be applied to the middle strata of the peasantry, whose resources have been crippled by the famine. An abrupt recovery of arrears that had accumulated over four or five years would mean, even supposing it were possible, a wholesale disintegration of the independent middle peasantry into the ranks of a depressed and capitalistically exploited lower middle peasantry or into the labor market. Against a background of high rates of assessment, this layer 2i would emerge out of every conjuncture of price depression or famine with a progressively weaker base for the process of reproduction. It would find it increasingly difficult to reconstitute its process of production from one year to the next and would generally end up as a depressed and completely dependent stratum. Further south in Satara, husbandmen may be roughly divided into four classes, 10% with good credit, 25% with fair credit, 40 with scanty credit, and 25% with less or with little or no credit. The 10% of first class husbandmen are well off. First class husbandmen also occasionally lend small sums to the poorer husbandmen of their own village. The 25% of the second class husbandmen are fairly well off, are fairly off, are fairly off. They are generally in need of no loans either for food or seed, but they often borrow to pay the government assessment and to meet the extraordinary expenses of marriages and other family events. The 40% of third class husbandmen are well off for a few months after harvest. During the rest of the year, they have to borrow for food as well as to pay the government assessment. In poor seasons, their condition is generally miserable. The 25% of the fourth class are badly off during the greater part of the year. Besides tilling small plots of land, they work as field laborers. Thus, the structure of the Deccan peasantry mirrored the different phases of the long run process of formal subsumption of labor into capital. The domination of capitalists in the specific form described earlier would extend over the vast mass of the small peasantry. As I have defined this, but within this mass of small peasants, the two layers distinguished earlier would reflect different degrees of subordination of labor to capital, or different moments of the actual process of formal subsumption. To repeat, under formal subsumption, the capitalist stands out as the immediate owner of the process of production, whether this ownership has been legally sanctified or not. The reconstitution of the production process depends on the advances of capital that he makes in the form of loans or advance payment. Now this degree of domination would cover only those households who depended precisely on such advances for their annual subsistence costs and means of production. It would cover, in other words, specifically that layer which was described above as a depressed and dependent middle peasantry. It follows that between the general condition and the levels of welfare and consumption of this stratum of the peasantry on one side and of the proletariat on the other, there would be scarcely any difference at all. In fact, referring to this specific group of households, Bapu Purshatam, a district deputy collector based in Dulia, thought that the condition of some of the landholders has been actually worse than that of day laborers. An official based elsewhere in Kandesh made the same point. In very many cases, the condition of the independent Katadar, independent in the sense of being nominally in control of his means in pro of production, is far worse than that of the poorest Saldar. When we grasp the underlying relations of production that such Katadars were involved in, that is their exploitation by capital, statements of this kind become easier to understand. Now in this whole argument, one further notion is implicit. The formal subsumption of labor into capital implies and entails a process of expropriation of the small producer. Thus a further conclusion from the analysis presented above is that precisely these middle strata of the peasantry suffered the process of expropriation especially severely. This is a conclusion strikingly confirmed by the data on land transfers. The most complete data that I have analyzed pertain to Tasgown for the nine years from 1866 to 1874, and the further five years from 1881 to 1885. Data on individual transactions are available only for the latter period, 
The analysis of this shows that of a total of 121 transactions over those five years, 40% involved land pieces of 10 to 20 acres in extent, and another 21% land pieces from 20 to 30 acres. The katas from which these land pieces derived would normally be somewhat bigger in size, as households would not have sold off the whole kata, but only specific portions of it. It follows that at least two-thirds and probably much more of the total number of transactions involved layers of the peasantry operating katas of more than 10 acres. In Satara, 10 acres, in fact, formed the critical divide between a household that could support itself in decent comfort and one that could not. The fourth class of households who in this district were said to be largely dependent on wage labor would tend to fall on one side of this divide, and the second and third classes or the small peasantry proper on the other. If we contrast the ratios in which these various groups figured in the overall distribution of holdings for the Toluca with the ratios of their participation in the list of land sales, as shown in Table 1, it is obvious that the middle strata of Tisgown's peasantry suffered the process of expropriation more severely than the other groups. In Tisgown, the movement of expropriation was concentrated in the years 1866-74. to 74. The aftermath of the cotton boom, and barely six or seven years later, it had lost its impetus. For villages with generally high transfer rates, those in the Krishna Valley and around Tisgown itself, the average annual rate of transfer in that early period was 4.4%. At this rate, had it been sustained, the entire arable land of these villages would have changed hands in just 22 years. In Tisgown, the expropriation of the small producer thus coincided mainly with a period of declining prices and recurrent scarcities. By the 80s, only about 100 of the Tolucas, 900 families of landowners, were thought to be entirely independent of debt. If middle peasants were exploited in the ways described above, poor peasants with katas of less than 10 acres in the more fertile areas were less than 30. In the barren eastern Tolucas of the Deccan depended on wage employment. Even here, the employers of hired labor were often the moneyed capitalists for a large proportion of small peasants were involved in transporting grain for money lenders who, by extortion of their surplus labor, had built up these reserves of grain. In Ahmednagar in January, when the busy season is over, many with their bullocks are hired by Marwaris and other traders to carry grain and oil seeds to Ahmednagar and Pune and the traders carts from Jemked, Karjat, Parner, and Shriganda. Alternatively, these and other lower strata of the peasantry would go for a time to Bombay and other places to work as laborers and carriers. In Pune, during the eighth month from October to June, a considerable proportion of the kundi, or cultivating classes, go to Bombay, where they earn a living as palanquin bearers carriers, grass cutters, and laborers. In Kalapur, the poor husbandmen work also as field laborers, chiefly in weeding and harvesting. In Sangli, the poorer husbandmen, when freed from field work, are employed as day laborers. These patterns of annual labor migration implying a structural dependence on wage labor would characterize only the lower groups of the peasantry. In contrast to them, in years of local scarcity, the people scatter in search of subsistence to all parts of the presidency. To the bears, to the bearers, and to the Marathwada. These were more random cyclical migrations that would involve a large proportion of the middle peasantry that found itself unable to survive in years of famine. Seasonal dependence on wage labor was more intense in the poorer regions of the Deccan, where alternative sources of income, such as the production of livestock, the sale of firewood, or timber or grass, could not substitute adequately. The man Toluca, the, the man Toluca in Satari was one such region. It was subject to constant droughts every, <clears throat> every year. Large numbers of people are forced to leave in search of work. Bintari in Pune is another example. Here the deficit which frequently exists in the peasant budget is made up of produce of stock and of the dairy 
and of the dairy, and by the wage labor of the Kunbi, and that of his family and his cattle. This exported labor must be looked upon as maintaining the solvency of the district, for little else is, is exported. Thus, wage labor was crucial to Bimtadi. It was likewise important in Shalapur, where large numbers would migrate annually, even in the best of years. The most dramatic case is, of course, the Konkan district of Ratnag Ratnagari, which supplied the bulk of the labor force for the nascent textile industries of Bombay. Ratnagari was, by universal consent, the most impoverished district of the presidency, characterized by overpopulation. Brutal quit-rent exploitation, permanent grain deficits, and large currents of outward migration. Here, the poorer class of cultivators maintain themselves by cutting every stick they can lay their, hand, lay their hands on. At the opposite pole of the presidency, Kandesha 4 is a case of the exception proving the rule, endowed with a better quality of soil, less prone to drought, and devoting a large portion or a large proportion of his arable to commodity production. The Kadesh Kanbi had seldom to leave his family holding in search of work. In Kandesh, hired laborers were recruited mainly from the Bill peasantry. Ten point seven. The stage of evolution of capitalism in the nineteenth century Deccan. The same form of capitalist exploitation that prevailed in the countryside worked in the small towns in relation to the smaller artisans. As a class, handloom weavers are entirely in the hands of moneylenders. The moneylenders advance all the yarn and silk required and take possession of the article. In Sitara, artisans generally procured their raw materials from the traders at high credit rates. The cotton weavers of this district were internally differentiated into a group that owned capital and employed wage labor, and a larger mass that borrow money from Gujars and war -war um, Marwaris to buy the yarn and pay for it by the articles they weave. Thus, in this branch of production as well, surplus value would be extorted from the small producer in the form of interest. This transitional and backward form of capitalist production was generally prevalent throughout the artisan economy of the Deccan. In Kandesh, very few artisans, not more than 10%, are free from debt. Koshtis are, as a rule, in the hands of moneylenders who advance money or yarn and in return get the goods when ready. Such weavers were said to work under the orders of their creditors. As in Satara, so in Kandesh, the weaving community was internally differentiated into a group of small capitalists who would lend money i.e. exploit artisan labor on a capitalist basis, and a large mass of proletarianized artisans employed by men of capital. Both men and women weave, keeping not more than 30 holidays in the year, and working except for about an hour's rest at noon, from morning to night, so long as they have light to see. In this district, the proletarianized weavers would thus have worked a minimum of 12 hours a day, a good workman might earn Rs. 200 a year, most of this in the busy season from May to October. In artisan more tightly, more, hold on, an artisan more tightly dominated by the capitalist would earn at most Rs. 140 and on average Rs. 90. The family as a whole would have to subsist on these rates of pay, and that in a period when subsistence costs were rising in the Deccan were rising in the Deccan towns with the expansion of the railway lines. When demand recessions inevitably followed periods of scarcity and famine, as they did in early, earlier epochs of production, e.g. in late medieval Europe, and when finally the money capitalists would be compelled to intensify the rate of exploitation of household labor, producing more absolute surplus value under the competitive threat of large-scale industries. In Nasik, the silk industry was composed of a small group around 10%, who have capital and work up and dispose of their own silk, and a majority group of skilled laborers employed by capitalists and paid by the piece. The average annual earnings of a, of a proletarianized silk weaver in Nasik would be around RS80. Finally, in Kalapar, the more dependent goldsmiths, also skilled workers, 
were employed by some rich bankers on daily wages to make ornaments for sale. They earned around RS90. The capital wage labor relationship was thus widespread throughout the Deccan in both town and countryside at a time when it was expanding fast in more modern forms in Bombay itself. This bears directly on the recent debate on the mode of production, which by general agreement has been inconclusive so far. In this debate, one, one tendency entirely denies the development of capitalist relations in the country. It argues that India is even today a semi-feudal country and that no bourgeois revolution, even of the passive type, analyzed by Antonio Gramsci has occurred here. Yet precisely the political activists of this tendency have for the last 10 years struggled against capitalist forms of exploitation in the countryside. And for this, they have been subjected to brutal repression by the bourgeois state. Two, a centrist current agrees that bourgeois relations have developed to a limited extent, but it argues that this development has taken place mainly since independence, mainly since independence. In the conclusion, I shall concentrate on the ten on this tendency. Three, finally, there is a Gunder Frankian tendency that sees in India's historical integration into the capitalist world economy sufficient proof of the prevalence of bourgeois relations within the country. Because the dominance of capitalist relations in the world scale is a more or less obvious fact, this tendency has never seriously undertaken the task of actually demonstrating in what forms bourgeois relations evolved within the country at best. And this would apply to Paresh Chopardier. Tendencies of this type appeal to a series of more or less isolated phenomena internal to the country's development, which relate, however, almost entirely to the process of commodity expansion and therefore only established that framework for the evolution of bourgeois relations had emerged internally. An assessment of the debate, which I do not propose here, would have to start with a pure historical impressionism that has characterized most of the contributions. Arguments were hardly ever related to the very concrete historical data comprised in countless numbers of volumes that are today only gathering dust in various record offices throughout the country. However, the method and understanding of theory that underlies the contributions are far more significant. Take the extreme formalism that, that attempts to classify households of the peasantry according to the labor exploitation criterion. To start with, Baduri and Petnik reflect a widespread tendency when they identify labor arrangements and forms of organization of the labor process implied by sharecropping and other types of tendency with pre tenancy with pre-capitalist or semi-feudal relations of production. Now, big peasants of the sort that we encountered in the 19th century, Deccan would be capitalist entrepreneurs in agriculture, who as a rule employ several hired laborers, but who do not necessarily confine themselves to labor arrangements involving only day workers or casual labor. They might, for example, maintain a reserve of permanent farm labor, as they did in Kandesh, or they might base their labor arrangements on one of several types of tenancy. If a big peasant or a big landowner chooses to substitute tenant labor for wage labor, then this could relate to a permanent shortage of labor in the area or to fact that wage costs have been rising, both true of Kandesh in the 19th century, or it could relate to the fact that tenancy is more profitable than wage labor and not because small scale farming is more efficient but because self-employed laborers make a fuller use of available labor. Again, which particular form of tenancy a big peasant or landowner decides to organize will depend on the type of cultivation, its specific technical requirements, a possible preference for piecework in an attempt to minimize costs, the degree of managerial control that this or that type allows, and so on and so forth. None of this affects the social character or content of the production relations that these labor arrangements embody. The big peasantry personifications of capital in the rudimentary forms in which capital exists within a small production economy, where the specifically capitalist mode of production is absent, do not change their social forms and functions as small capitalists merely according to the types of labor arrangements they deploy or the labor contracts that they enforce. Lenin was quite aware of this and therefore delivered a warning. He wrote, 
Our literature frequently contains too stereotyped an understanding of the theoretical proposition that capitalism requires the free, landless worker. The allotment of land to the rural worker is very often done in the interests of the rural employers themselves. The type assumes different forms in different countries, forms that Lenin correctly thought were historically conditioned. However, Patnaik is quite insistent. Starting from the erroneous identification of A, the particular labor arrangements and labor contracts deployed by employers in the countryside, and B, the relations of production as such, she forces herself to split up the capitalist peasantry into a proto-feudal rich peasantry and a proto-bourgeois rich peasantry. Verbal contortions of this type only indicate the complete lack of clarity into which her approach inevitably leads. Baduri's empiricism is identical in content. All the superficial forms of the formal subordination of labor to capital are converted into independent substantive features that express entirely different production relations. To start with, indebtedness as such is not a hallmark of pre-capitalist relations, if only because it is precisely through the power of money that the despotism of capital is initially established. In the second place, when Baduri distinguishes usury and property rights in land as, sep as two separate modes of exploitation of labor power, he only grasps the distinction of form within capital itself, for both money and land are simply used as capital, i.e. for the extortion of surplus value. The tying of labor to this or that individual capital landowner does not, in the least, alter the content of the social relation as one of capitalist domination. For such forms of bondage are precisely a characteristic of the formal subordination of labor to capital, that is, of a system in which capital retains its individual character. All of these points could be summed up if we return to the specific way in which Lenin understood the development of bourgeois relations in the so-called domestic industries, in this case, the pottery industry around Moscow. The relations in this industry, too, and similar examples could be quoted indefinitely, are bourgeois. We see how a minority owning larger and more profitable establishments and receiving a net income from the labor of others accumulates savings, while the majority are ruined. It is obvious and inevitable that the latter should be enslaved to the former, inevitable precisely because of the capitalist character of the given production relations. These relations are the product of social labor, organized by commodity economy, passes into the hands of individuals and in their hands serves as an instrument for oppressing and enslaving the working people as a means of personal enrichment by the exploitation of the masses. And do not think that this exploitation, this oppression is any less marked because relations of this kind are still poorly developed because the accumulation of capital concomitant with the ruination of the producers is negligible. Quite the contrary, this only leads to cruder surf forms of exploitation to a situation where capital, not yet able to subjugate the worker directly by the mere purchase of his labor power at its value, enmeshes him in a veritable net of usurious extortion binds him to itself by kulak methods, and as a result robs him not only of the surplus value, but of an enormous part of his wages too. Thus, here's a case of the development of bourgeois relations necessitating crude surf forms of exploitation. The position would obviously have been no different in the Deccan countryside and towns, and is no different in many parts of India today where the subordination of labor to capital remains formal. As I suggested earlier, Baduri, Patnaik, and others of a similar tendency simply confuse the capitalist's command over the process of production with the, specific, with the specifically capitalist form of the labor process. At the first level, the command or intervention of capital summarizes a value relationship pure and simple, a relationship of surplus value production or of the process of production as a valorization process. All that is necessary to the constitution of this command is that a relationship of pure economic dependence prevail between the producer and himself, and that on this basis he compels the production of surplus labor. This general social despotism of capital over labor may find its adequate expression or shape within the specifically capitalist form of the labor process, relative surplus value production, based on machinery and the increasing predominance of fixed capital. There remains all the same an important distinction between the two, and it is that 
this that Baduri, Putnik, and others have yet to grasp. For even where the labor process remains external to the movement of capital as a process of centralizing social means of production and labor power for the more effective extortion of surplus value, capital may, can, and does extort surplus labor in the form of surplus value. This brings us directly to a central underlying premise of the whole debate, one common in different ways to all sides. Positions downgrading the development of capitalist relations in India automatically suppose that if you deny that a specifically capitalist mode of production prevailed in India or does prevail today, then you would be denying the prevalence of capitalist forms of exploitation of whatever type. However, under underdeveloped the stage sorry, the stage of bourgeois production that they express. This is a premise that totally contradicts Marx, Marx's whole effort to distinguish the specific modes of subordination of labor to capital. It contradicts the view proposed by Marx himself that the formal subsumption of labor under capital can be found as a particular form alongside the specifically capitalist mode of production in its developed form. Because although the latter entails the former, the converse does not necessarily obtain. That is to say, the formal subsumption of labor under capital can be found even in the absence of the developed form of the capitalist mode of production positing large-scale industry, social forces of production, etc. This essay has attempted to demonstrate precisely this thesis within a concrete frame of reference. It shows that 1. The bourgeois mode of production in its developed or adequate structure was neither dominant nor widespread within the country, that in this sense, India remained a backward nation that had yet to witness a process of large-scale industrialization. Two, but capitalist relations of exploitation signifying the less advanced forms of capitalist production had emerged within a conjuncture of expanding commodity production and were widespread and were widespread and in some districts dominant. Under this system, the moneyed capitalists of the Deccan exerted a definite control over the process of production, even if the process of labor as such remained technologically continuous with the labor process of the small production economy. A greater proportion of the small peasantry and town-based handicraftsmen were in no position to reconstitute the process of production from year to year. The capitalists advanced them their wages and means of production as loans and recovered his surplus value as interest. These relations did not, of course, transcend the limits of the production of absolute surplus value. So that increases in the rate of exploitation of labor power were purely a function of the most primitive forms of labor intensification and a lengthening of the working day. This stage of development, called by Marx the formal subordination of the labor of capital, of labor to capital, was the specific stage the Deccan districts had reached towards the final decades of the 19th century. What is wrong then with the position that argues the, that relations within the backward countries were capitalist from their very inception as components of world economy tendency? When we locate the national economic forms that crystallized in various parts of the country within the deeper context of an expanding capitalist world economy, then it is immediately apparent that the nationally dominant forms of subsumption of labor into capital were merely a particular form alongside the specifically capitalist mode of production. For the determination of capital as a social reproduction process or of capital as social capital reflects itself most adequately in the form of world capital, and this composed the deeper framework of the process of commodity expansion that started in the Deccan around the 1850s. Well before the cotton boom, every poor cotton harvest in America, for example in 1836, 1838, 1845, 1846, 1849, had revived and stimulated the interest of British capitalists in an Indian cotton supply. After 1848, the Manchester Chamber After 1848, the Manchester Chamber of Commerce began a systematic and concerted campaign to secure government interest in a supply from India. This agitation occurred against the background of a steady rise in the price of the standard American quality. By 1861, the program of the Cotton Supply Association included as its major objectives the conversion of land into a commodity, the establishment of effectual courts of law, with the power to enforce contracts and massive state expenditure in public works that would link the cotton districts to the port of Bombay.
It was around this time on the eve of the boom that an interesting debate broke out on the specific mechanisms through which an expanded supply of cotton could be procured. On one side were men like Sir Charles Wood, Secretary of State for India, who thought that a fair and remunerative price was a sufficient basis for an expansion of the supply. That is, that the small peasants of the cotton districts had direct access to the market and would allocate their means of production in response to the movement of market prices. On the other side, J.B. Smith, orthodox free trader and president of the Manchester Chamber of Commerce, argued that the Indian peasant was not a free agent, but enthralled to money lenders, so that demand according to our European notion is not comprehended in India. Of course, both sides were both right and wrong. The Chamber of Commerce, in believing that the small producer was not, at f at f not a free agent, that is a simple commodity producer, was fundamentally correct, but as the boom would show them in only one or two years, the movement of market prices was a basic determinant of the level of supply, if only because the men who had come to control the process of production of the small producer, <clears throat> those who dominated him as a wage slave, found nothing incomprehensible in the European conception of profitability. The commodity expansion of those years was thus rooted quite specifically in the world demand for commodities like cotton, wheat, oil seeds, and food grains generally. It was rooted, in other words, in the expansive rhythms of the world reproduction process of capital, and in the sense the specific form of capitalist production that evolved within the local commodity framework composed a subordinate and transitional system within the bourgeois mode of production in its world extension. Now the Gunder Frankian tendency sees only this general or abstract determination. <clears throat> the pressures of the world reproduction process of capital and their mediation through the estate, this general determination becomes its idée fix, its peculiar obsession, so that it then supposes that it is sufficient to point to the dominance of the specifically capitalist mode of production on the world scale to establish the prevalence of capitalist relations in India. Thus, whereas positions of the second type combine a formalist a priorism with crude empiricism, positions of the third type directly subordinate the concrete to the abstract in the manner of Ricardo's understanding of the value relation. Here are the real process that unifies essence and appearance that makes them parts of a single process is completely ignored. The concrete processes by which capitalist relations evolved in various parts of world economy are simply dissolved in the abstract the abstract identity identity of world capitalism. <clears throat>